people are hiding a lot of pain and despair and even loneliness and even suicidal thinking. You said that in the future, every one of us, we will know somebody that has killed themselves. I mean, that sent shivers down my spine. It's filled to the brim with warnings and dangers. This is a real problem. Perfect looking kid who is 17 and has gotten accepted to a wonderful dream school and then kills himself. But that perfectionism is not positive. It, it is mm -hmm. destructive. Dr. Margaret Rutherford is a clinical psychologist with over three decades of experience in the field. She is the author of the concept and the book of the same name perfectly hidden depression. Dr. Rutherford's work has been instrumental in shedding light on this hidden struggle, helping countless individuals recognize their own battles with depression and seek the help they need. Dr. Rutherford hosts the Self Work Podcast, where she shares insights and advice on mental health. Because we're not asking the right questions and we're not noticing what's not there. That's what a lot of people do who identify with perfectly hidden depression. Thinking about suicide is normal, is common, more than we know. We all have struggles in different areas and that it's okay to be transparent about that. Because I made some pretty bad choices in my 20s. I was on a very destructive cycle. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning edtech company serving over a million students nationwide. We understand that as parents, you want to ensure that your child receives the best education possible. Say hello to Argo Prep. With over 15 plus educational awards earned in just the past year, Argo Prep's platform offers your child video lessons, quizzes, drills, printable worksheets, and more. Best of all, your Argo Prep subscription comes included with four comprehensive digital workbooks that cover all four subjects math, ELA, science, and social studies. Visit argoprep.com today and start your free trial. Dr. Margaret, welcome. I wanted to start off by congratulating on you on your on your TEDx speech that was just released last month. It was a huge eye opener and a very moving speech. Uh, this is this is, and by the way, if any if if you have not watched the TEDx video, you have to go ahead and see it. This is such an important video, and we're going to go ahead and get right into it right now. So, in your talk, sure, you talk about the concept of perfectly hidden depression, a term that you coined to describe individuals who outwardly appear successful and content, but are internally struggling with depression. Now, yeah. these individuals are often hiding their struggles due to fear and shame, creating a facade of perfection that can be difficult to penetrate. So now the current medical model of mental illness, which based on DSM-5, often fails to identify these individuals because they do not fit the traditional criteria right. for depression. So my first question to you, so so we have a really good foundational understanding. It's a bit of a of conundrum, is, isn't it? It's like, well, how am I supposed to recognize it if they're not coming in and telling me what's really underneath that facade? It's a, I mean, that's sort of a, a very common sense question, but I'm trying to, certainly in the TEDx and in my book, trying to, to uh, present an idea or a concept or an awareness so that people will understand what kind of one is clinicians, what kind of questions do we need to ask? And two, just if you're in the general public or your friend seems, you know, you've never heard her talk about the death of her father, or you've never, your best friend moved out and, and she was a best friend too. And she never says, gosh, I really miss her or whatever it is. It's, it's people are hiding a lot of pain and despair and even loneliness and even suicidal thinking. And that's what we really need to address in this culture. One of the many things, but certainly the one that I am most passionate about. Wow. So, you know, before I even get into some of the basic questions, the, out of your entire talk, you had a moment where you said that in the future, every one of us or our children will experience that they will, we will know somebody that
that has killed themselves, but they had it all together or they exactly. had it out really all together. I mean, that sent shivers down my spine. Can you, can you elaborate on that? That, I mean, that is, that's a, that's a bold claim. Uh, that's a scary claim, but if that's true, I mean, we really need to figure, we really need to go ahead and educate the public on this. Well, I, I was careful. In fact, I worked with a coach who was wonderful. And he said, I, because I had said it exactly like you just said it. And he had me, he had me change it to, you'll either know someone personally, or you will hear the story of someone who, but even in, even in just hearing the story of someone, um, you know, it's, um, I think we will, I think many of us do. Uh, now, because of my work and because of the book, and I, I know a lot of people, in fact, that's how I got the TEDx, is mm -hmm. that someone three years ago, her name is Cindy Metzler, reached out to me in 2020 and asked if she could talk to me about my book. I said, of course. Um, and she and a friend of hers, Trisha, we got on a Zoom, and Trisha, one of Trisha's best friends, had killed herself uh, very well known in the community, loved mother of two or three, I can't quite remember. Uh, and her husband at the funeral came up to Trisha and said, I found this on my now deceased wife's bedside table. And it was my book. Wow. So they became very interested in talking wow. with me. And that led to me doing a couple of just short little brief seminars from some of their groups. But I didn't know Cindy Metzler was a TEDx organizer. I had no idea. And mm. then the more she heard about it and the more she started reading what I had written or, or listening to podcasts about it, she said, I'd really like you to submit to TEDx. And I did one year and I didn't get in. And then I got in this year. So um, I, I, I do know that this message is so important. And it's really, even in Dr. Renee Brown's work, um, she talks about perfectionism and depression and the fear of vulnerability, but probably because she's not a clinician, she didn't take that extra step of saying, but yes, it is also a suicide. It's a suicide risk. And, and yet w the academic re researchers of the people in the universities who are doing these researchers research, they, it, it's filled to the brim with warnings and dangers. This is a real problem. You know, we're right. used to depression looking like melancholy or or even agitation or something like that. But it can also be that perfect looking kid who who is 17 and has gotten accepted to a, you know, a wonderful dream school and then kills himself. So, um, you know, it's it is it is something that we've got to understand that there are ways we could prevent that from happening. And that was the import of the TEDx. Hey there, before we dive back into the episode, I wanted to stop for just a brief moment and express our heartfelt gratitude. Knowing that you've chosen to spend your time with us to listen and engage with our content truly warms our hearts. Every story we share, every topic we discuss is made much more meaningful if you are here with us on this journey. If you found value in what you've heard so far and you're excited as we are about the episodes to come, we'd be so honored if you'd hit that subscribe button. It not only ensures you stay informed of all of our new content, but it also supports us in continuing to create and share. From all of us here, a sincere thank you. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the episode. I want to thank you so much for your work because it wasn't the videos, but it's typically always the comments. And I've read so many of the comments that you've received on the videos mm -hmm. where they were thanking you because on if it, whether it's clinicians or just regular individuals that have different careers, they had an idea, but they didn't know how to put it in words and right. your work has allowed it to be very transparent and put it perfectly into words. So thank you for that. I mean, that that's Absolutely. really what you've done here, which is incredible. And so I, I, I want to, okay, so are there common signs or symptoms that somebody is experiencing? We'll, call, we'll call it depression. short PhD, calling... but perfectly hidden depression. Sure. Yes. And I want to make sure people know, I don't, I don't think I'm narcissistic enough. I hope not where I would come up with my own diagnosis that nobody has ever diagnosed before. That's not true. What I, I think of perfectly hidden depression as is a syndrome 
which means that it is a set of behaviors and beliefs that are found together, kind of like salt and pepper or red hair and freckles or something. But the, the most famous syndrome is codependence, probably, where, you know, back years ago, people who were uh, lo- who were loved and for trying to live life with alcoholics realized that they had a certain belief about that and a certain behaviors around that called enabling that they had to sort of admit. And I thought, okay, so this isn't a diagnosis. What is it? And I thought the closest thing that I know would be a syndrome. And there are 10 traits that I, I literally, uh, on a yet, I, I sat down and, and I, and I thought about several of the people that I'd worked with through the years that I thought would fit into this rubric. Plus I did 60 interviews with people who volunteered from all over the world who had was, I was trying to figure out what this was. And I saw so I was writing on my blog about it and they volunteered and they told me their stories it took me a long time. And I, I said, what, what, are, what do these people have in common? What are the threads that would, um, that, that they would all, um, not all, not, that not, that not everybody's all 10, but which of the ones are the strongest. And the ones that came most strongly to mind were this very perfectionistic need for control kind of persona, often very successful, but that, but that perfectionism is not, it's not, um, positive. It, it is mm-hmm. destructive. It, it is not constructive because constructive perfectionism is, is sort of innate. It's like, I really want to do my best. I get a lot of joy and fulfillment out of that. I enjoy the process. I can fail and I'm okay. Destructive perfectionism is more shamed in my view by, I'm sorry, it is not fueled. It's fueled by shame and fear. Uh, you usually absorbed messages about yourself that uh, you weren't supposed to have painful feelings and certainly not express them. There could be a lot of reasons for that. And so you grow up believing that as a child and it becomes so entrenched in your way of being mm-hmm. that it's just the way I am. And what I found out from people is when they heard perfectly hidden depression, when they heard that term, light bulbs went off. Um, and so the other major thread is that you just can't express emotional pain. You may be able to say, oh yes, that made me very sad. But to express it, to actually feel it in the moment, especially if someone else is present, that's not, Mm. that's very, very difficult for these people. And they are terrified that other people will see anything about them that is vulnerable. And so they hide it and hide it and hide it. Um, It's... (sighs) I, I've had many people, and now I live in Arkansas, and so not many people as far as metropolitan areas are concerned, but I've had a fair share of people who have come into my private practice, and I've worked with them on just mm-hmm. this. I talked about two of them in the TED Talk, and you, you point out this very important point that until they uh, heard that term, in fact, one of them said to me one time, you know, I knew something was wrong. I, and so I got up at like two o'clock in the morning and I looked up depression and sure enough, here were, here were all the symptoms of depression. Right. Uh, as you know, properly diagnosed, you don't enjoy anything. You don't have any energy. You, your mood, you're so depressed. Your friends are worried about you. You can't make decisions. You, you know, you're sleeping all the time or wanting or not sleeping at all. And they said, no, I mean, maybe I'm not sleeping every now and then, but that's not me. And they would feel this right. incredible shame that they even thought of themselves as perhaps I'm depressed. So they'd hide mm. more. Wow. That is bizarre. <laughs> mm-hmm. What an interesting and yet such a bizarre situation where you can take a look at that, but because they're so high achieving, it's not, I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's many times they'll go down that list and say, nope, none of these apply nope, to me. Nope, nope, nope. That's right. Okay. And unfortunately, I... clinicians are going to do the same thing. There was right. a psychiatrist. So I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, finish it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There was a psychiatrist in Scotland who um, I, I read a couple of t- tweets when, when it was still tweeting. I know it's Xing now. I'm not sure what it is, but um, 
she said, you know, as soon as somebody walks in my door, I have to admit if they have a big smile on their face and they say, hello, doctor, I'm so-and-so and stick out their hand. I think, oh, no, it's not depression. You know, so we have these assumptions we make because we're not asking the right questions and we're not noticing what's not there. We notice what's there, but we're not noticing what's not there. What needs to happen for that to change? And a specific, uh, speaking specifically for clinici clinicians, right? So like mm -hmm. what needs to change so clinicians are better equipped to actually go ahead and, and see if they fall into that category? Great, great question. And I have done a fair amount of, tree, of uh, 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 seminars for clinicians. And the idea that I tell them is uh, I'm borrowing it um, from the cardiology field. In cardiology, many women, or when they would go to their cardiologists years ago and they would tell them what kind of symptoms they were having, the doctor would say, well, no, I don't think you have, you're, you're, got a lot of potential for heart attack and they would have a heart attack because the research was being done on men and mm. women have some of the same symptoms of a potential heart attack as men do, but they have others as well that are different. And so mm -hmm. when they began looking at, wait a minute, what is women's, what are, what are the signs that women might have a heart attack? Many more potential heart attacks were caught because they changed their awareness so what I'm suggesting that we in mental health need to do, the, the DSM-5 or the DSM diagnostic criteria is very important. I'm not knocking it, but it cannot be the only, the, the unique way you assess whether someone's depression. I, I did this interview with someone who's a clinician and she had, she also read the book actually, which was wonderful, but she said, I've added a question to my suicide assessment. And I said, what's that? She said, um, she said, not only do I say, you know, have you ever considered killing yourself or suicide? Do you have suicidal thoughts? And they'd say, oh, no, 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 no. She said, but if you did, would you tell anyone? And the mm. answer could be, you know, probably not. And that would be a little window into how much may be going on behind the scenes. Wow. I also suggest that clinicians look for this inability to express emotions um, or painful emotions. I, I, I notice myself that when these kind of folks come in, they will talk about something that's really pain, like rape or having al alcoholic parents or um, having a divorce where you lost custody of your children or whatever it happens to be. Um, and, they kind of smile when they're talking about it. Oh, well, you know, that was really, I've got to work through that. And when I question them about it, they go, oh, I just, you know, I, I have so many blessings in my life. Sure, I was raped, but, you know, it was just once. And they'd smile. And so there's this disconnect between what they're saying, the content of what they're saying, and their emotional uh connection with it or their emotional attachment to it. Um, and I remember one time I said to someone, you know, if I could, if I had been recording this session and you had just told me about being raped and I turned the volume down, I would have thought you were telling me what you had for lunch. Mm. And so there's this, so clinicians have to listen for how things are being said rather than, you know, oh, well, okay, well, she's okay with that. Okay. You have to make sure you're listening very, very differently. But on that side note, uh, on that topic, is is that remotely a healthy mechanism for someone because that allows? So, yes. Yeah, it is. But it's just, the, it's just the job of the clinician to understand and dig a little bit deeper. I, I wouldn't call it healthy. What I would say was that the the psychology easy word for it is compartmentalization. That let's say my dog had died this morning and I knew that I had this interview today. Right. You know, I can't just be sobbing and telling you how much I love my dog because my I I I'm booked to do this interview and it's important to me to do it. So I compartmentalize it. I I put that pain away. If I'd won the lottery, if I was that one billion dollar winner or whatever it is, um, and if I'd won that lottery, I would put that away too because this was more important at the moment. 
So compartmentalization is a very healthy skill, but when you overuse it, when that's the only skill you have, mm. that's the only way you have of handling pain, I'll just put it in that, I'll stick it in that emotional closet again and tie up, you know, lock the door and, and put towels around the bottom so nothing seeps out. You know, it's, 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 that's what a lot of people do who identify with perfectly hidden depression. Okay, this makes me want to ask a question about new parents or pa people who are about to be parents. For example, mm -hmm. I'm about to be a parent in about two months. My wife oh, is pregnant. Congratulations. I'm extremely excited. Thank oh, you very much. Man. Yeah. But things like this make me want to ask the question, what, what, what advice or what kind of words do new parents need to know to prevent? I mean, I, I know you can't prevent it, but on the right path, so we don't, so our, our, our children don't experience this. Another wonderful question. Um, and in fact, very important question. I think you have to model vulnerability. You have to model talking to your kids about in, in an age appropriate way, obviously, when, when you've struggled, when you've been disappointed and you, when maybe you've cried or maybe you've, you know, you just wanted to be by yourself or you've been embarrassed or whatever it happens to be, you've made mistakes that you've had to find a way through. And, and, and then you want to make sure that in the family that you have, you give your children space to, to be angry or to be sad. And again, not to have tantrums and not respect everybody else's boundaries, but you don't disallow it. And so you create mm -hmm. this, this vulnerability. I, I use a story. My son says, just so I don't say too much uh, about it, that I can use it. He called me in college and uh, he told me about something he'd done. And I first had this mother's reaction. It was not a smart thing. And at first I had this mother's reaction. Oh no. Oh no. And then he said, mom, I know you did this too. So that's why I called you. Mm. I went, Oh, that's right. Wow. I did do it. And because I had told him about it and just been honest with him about it. And so I said, okay, let's just, I understand. Let's talk about this. I know exactly where you are. I know exactly how you're feeling. Um, or pretty similarly, you know, let me, let me help you with this because he trusted that I wouldn't freak out and which I did a little and that I could use my own experience. Children absorb that. They absorb yeah. what they see you as and what they see you doing, what they see you talking about, uh, what they see you expressing and feeling. So that's the best prevention method that I know. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I have been, I have been, um, uh, wanting at times when, uh, you know, television programmers, something terrible has happened to a child and they've killed themselves or died by suicide and they trot out these things you need to recognize in your adolescence and that that's what they tell parents to do. Watch for isolation, watch for, watch for their grades going down, watch for this, watch for that. And that is true for some kinds of depression. For this kind of mm. depression, that's not right. going to work. You have to model that. You have to say, hey, you know, if it looks too good, sometimes it is too good. What's going on? You know, so. Right. Wow. Excellent advice. Uh, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted individuals with PhD? Has there been any specific trends or challenges coming out of the pandemic? That's another, you, you're you really, you ask great questions. Um, <laughs> Thank you. you know, I, I published the book in 2019 in November and then bam, we got hit with the pandemic. So um, I, th I think my first reaction to that would be, in some ways, um, well, I know some of this. I know that because perfectionists like a lot of order and organization, and sometimes they do have a little of OCD qualities to them, uh, that some of it was very difficult because of um, them feeling that their 
order and their their control. They had control of things, and then all of a sudden they didn't. Um, so I know that has been difficult. Um, on the other hand, uh, with everyone's or many many people staying at home, I think it's probably easier for them to to stay hidden uh, mm. because whoever might be clued into them. Um, probably wouldn't see them as much. And so you can hide by me. Oh yeah, everything's great. Um, yeah. and so I think probably it depends on how it was being, how that perfectly hidden depression was being manifested in their lives. Mm. Um, to answer that question, I haven't really thought about that question. I, mm. I think it's a, a great question. I want to ask you something. So I know, I, I know in your TEDx talk, you mentioned that thinking about suicide is normal. Thinking about suicide is common more than we know. Right. What a beautiful statement. What an impactful statement. And you said we can have an impact right now in our culture. Earlier on, we talked about the clinical aspect of things, but I want to ask you as a society what is it going to take for us to ch to change this? Because I wish your TEDx, you know, video gets to four billion views because that would be fantastic. What a yeah. what an amazing way to educate, right? But education. Make sure is you expensive. like it and comment on it. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 and I, I after some reflection, I mean, I, it's such an impactful statement. But how, how are we going to change this as a society, or or are we too far gone? And is this nearly inevitable? Are we just poised to hear the stories about that successful person that seemed like it was all great, but he killed himself or she killed himself? Right. Well, even though these, these things I'm about to say are going to sound contradictory because there are rising rates in teenagers of suicide and uh, perfectionism rates are going up as are suicide rates. Um, however, I think a very hopeful thing is that millennials and Gen Zers are also seeking therapy more. They're more open to talking mm. about who they really are. Um, and the, the answer, I, I use the word transparency a lot. Um, and I, I also want to tell your listeners something that I had a, um, a psychologist who I respect a lot um, contacted me and said, Margaret, I'm not sure that I agree with you that we should call suicidal thinking normal because if you, there's a, a lot of suicide that's impulse driven. And if you call it normal, then maybe someone's going to be able to give themselves more permission to do that. I don't mm. really, where I disagree with him is that, I mean, I pondered this heavily, <laughs> uh, changed it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth because I, the, the normalcy of it is, is the, to me a very important message because people have this idea that if I have a thought of, well, what would it be just like if I disappeared? That somehow that is a, a um, terrible trait. That is a shameful trait in their personality. And we therapists know that people that everybody respects and that, you know, sometimes has these ideas of this is just, I don't I can't live through this. I don't know how to live through it. I feel into it feels too heavy, too, too heavy. And so if we can say that's normal, that, that is human, that is common to feel like you can't, you can't work through it. And so, but if we tell people that's not a bad, you know, feelings aren't bad and good. Feelings are feelings and fears are fears. And so it, it is about your transparency. And if I'm transparent with you, then hopefully you will be more transparent with me. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have suggested to someone way before I even thought about perfectly hidden depression, I would have someone um, in my office who would, I'd say, well, who, who else have you told that you struggle with, you know, uh, you know, d worry or despair or loneliness or uh, anger about your past or whatever. They go, oh, yeah, just you. You know, I can't tell anybody because they tell somebody else. I said, well, now, wait a minute. Who in your world, there's bound to be one person in your world that you know that you feel like I could give them a confidence of mine. I could ask them to keep something confidential, and they would. Well, yeah, I do know that person. 
what would it be like to talk to them? Oh, I don't know if I could do that. So we just keep on. I say, okay. But gradually, if, if they risk just that one time, that person will say, you know, I felt the same way or, or I'm on antidepressants or I, I don't talk about my kid who's on drugs because I'm afraid I, people will see mm. me as a bad dad or a, da- right. a bad mom. I don't talk about some of this stuff either. And if we can begin to recognize that we all have struggles in different areas and that it's okay to be transparent about that, not to necessarily dump our stuff on everybody else, but to say, you know, I, I need to feel like this doesn't make me a, a bad person, a, a person that I should feel shame about, that it is something that is part of being human. I mean, I've, I've talked about my own panic disorder, which, st- oh, and was I ever experiencing it at that TEDx? <laughs> oh my gosh, it was incredible. I got off that stage and I was just shaking like a leaf. Um, yeah. And, and I've had anorexia in the past and have struggled through that. And I've been divorced a couple of times and now about to celebrate my 33rd anniversary. So, you know, but it, it, we, we make mistakes, we struggle, we have our issues. And, and uh, one of my quotes that I'm sort of working on myself, it's my working definition of self-acceptance is believing that your strengths don't define you any more than your weaknesses and vice versa. Mm. Your weaknesses don't define you any more than your strengths. They're just lateral with one another. They're both parts of you. Wow. That's actually very powerful. I'm going to have to take a moment to reflect on that. Actually. Uh, I want to flip the script briefly and talk about the other way around. Let's say a friend, a dear friend of mine comes to me and says, says that they're having suicidal thoughts. And I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I know you briefly mentioned uh, on uh, on your talk about this, where so many of us are so quick to say the the regular responses, like, yeah. "How could you even think about that? You have two kids. What are you going to do with the t- What right. are you going to do with the two kids?" My question to you now is: If someone approaches me or whoever is listening and says, "Hey, I'm having suicidal thoughts or X, Y, and Z on, on that area." What should we do? What should our response be? Because I'll be honest, I don't know what to do myself, right? It's just it, yeah. I, I, many of us don't know. So I'd love to take this as a learning lesson as to what I should be doing or some of the things that I should be doing in response. Yeah. Well, I, I think the first thing to remember is when someone shares something like that with you, uh, unless they are doing it in a manipulative fashion, which then even then mm-hmm. you want to pay attention to it. You want to treat it seriously. Um, but to say, you know, I appreciate your trust in me that you're telling me this. I, I realize that that is a hard thing to admit to anybody. And I, I'm honored that you're talking to me about it. How can I help you? Um, even just your acceptance of it and not your horror of it will already be healing. Mm. You know, can I, can I, I, I've gone to counseling. Can I help you hook, you know, hook up with a counselor? Can I, um, can I pick your kids up and and give you some time by yourself? Can I, um, have, does your family know, or, and they might say, Oh no, my family doesn't know. And I don't want them to know. Okay. You know, if, now if they keep telling you that, then sometimes you have to say to somebody, this is not a secret I can keep anymore. Mm. I mean, this is, you're, you're sounding more and more serious. So again, right. it sort of depends on the amount of strengths and skills they have. But I think the first awareness to have is, wow, this is really an honor that they're sharing this with me. And I need to be careful that I don't judge and, and, and label it as something horrific and out of the norm, you know, that they would feel. Um, now, again, there are people who, um, you know, have sort of chronic suicidal thoughts and even attempts and that can, that can wear a relationship down and it can, that's part of their actual struggle. That's part of their pathology that they use suicidal threats as, um, not necessarily even intentionally, um, mm-hmm. but they're trying to get some attention. You know, oh, that's a, 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 an attention getter. 
occasionally. Right. Yes, that can happen, but you have to take all of it seriously. And so, you know, trying to encourage them to get some help or, you know, just saying, I'm here to talk about it with you. And then if you get overwhelmed to say, you know, this is a little above my ability to help. And can I help you find a counselor? Um, and mm. so, you know, just approach it that way, I think. Oh, wonderful. Have just two last questions for you, but I was thinking about this question. It's a, maybe it's a, not a fair question to ask. It's probably a silly question. I but, uh, Seriously? You, you see plenty of articles coming out. And my question to you is, <laughs> has, <laughs> well, I'm gonna laugh with you. I don't has, know a younger, has a younger generation got too soft, right? I, 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 I see all these articles saying, yeah. you know, whatever happened to creating, you know, hard men or hard leaders. And now, you know, you go to the startup culture and everything is so friendly and, and nobody knows how to take a constructive criticism. I, I, I don't yeah. know if, how, I, how I agree with that, but you can look it up right now. There's so many articles out there right oh, yeah. now that's, that's saying we're creating a generation that is quote unquote weak just wanted to see if you had any not, thoughts not about that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when, I mean, I'll, I'll use the very trite example of, you know, when my kid, I have a 29 year old son and when he would play soccer, you know, some of the team would say, well, everybody gets an award. Everybody gets a prize. And <laughs> he would look at me and go, mom, we lost. Why in the, well, why in the, in the world are we getting, <laughs> you know, a, 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 a trophy? Um, but because of a lot of parenting and because of such uh, intense uh, parental um, control of what their kids do um, in a lot of environments now, obviously not, you know, in poverty stricken areas, but um, and in poverty stricken families. Um, then, you know, uh, uh, the reason seems to be for that, that it's a lot about the way we've parented these kids. The, so the flip side of, and I think this is what you're referring to, the flip side of they're asking for help more often and they're asking for guidance and they're having trouble adulting, um, then the flip side of that is, you know, why don't they have more resilience? Why don't they have more um, strength? And in fact, I, I've been um, criticized because people have said you're pathologizing courage and when the mm. tough get, you know, when it gets tough, the tough get going. And I'm not pathologizing that. I'm saying if, if, if that is true resilience, that's fine. But courage and resilience allow for the presence of fear true mm. courage and resilience mm. allow for the presence of fear and to just go into achievement and, you know, in order to feel okay and in control that I must achieve and in, in fact, exceed expectations constantly, then I'm on a treadmill that I have no control over um, the incline or the speed. So I do think that there's a, there's a yin and a yang of the way that we have parented um, this generation and, um, you know, they do need to find more resilience. They do need to fall on their mm. butts more and get, you know, figure out to pick themselves up and dust themselves, dust themselves off and go. Um, but again, they are the generation that, you know, was also seeking therapy and just saying, right. you know, because I'm asking right. for help does not mean I'm a weak person. So there you go. Right, right. A hundred percent. I want to ask you one last question, which we usually like to end the podcast with, which is who has been the most uh, strongest or most inspiring person in your life and what lessons have you learned from them? Oh my goodness. Hmm. Well, Two people come to mind. Can I have two? Can I cheat and have two? Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> One is my dad. Um, my dad had a, had a great inner strength. Now, he was not somebody that talked much about vulnerability or his own vulnerabilities. But what he did with people, and he did it with me, because <clears throat> I made some pretty bad choices in my 20s. Um, I was on a very destructive cycle 
and I knew that he was not at all approving. In fact, quite disapproving. But he he just was there for me. He stayed in when I was floundering. Um, he didn't, he just stayed, he just was always there. And in fact, years later, um, there was one incident where um, I even looked around, I was acting silly and like getting divorced wasn't a big deal. And I was already with somebody else. And I saw a, a, a tear roll down my dad's cheek when he was driving a Ute haul for me to move a bunch of my stuff out of my old house. <clears throat> and I was laughing and I just thought, and I saw that tear and I realized how ashamed he was of me, how sad he was about me. Years later, I told him I'd seen that and he looked at me and he said, well, thank you. But I knew in mm -hmm. that moment that he loved me despite my, despite myself. Right. Um, so he showed me a wonderful lesson. The other person is what I call my pseudo grandmother. I had known her as a little girl, but I re-met her when I was 24 and she was 84. Her name was Et wow. and Ethel. Um, and she didn't die till she was 104. So wow. I watched her age and I watched her keep her sense of humor and I watched her um, talk about some of the things that were hard. Uh, she she was a very religious woman, and when she got to be 90, she said, well, I guess my friends are up there in heaven saying, well, I guess it didn't make it. <laughs> so anyway, she was just funny, and she um, she taught me about resilience. She had buried her husband, her son, and her grandson, who had, her grandson had died by suicide. Wow. And I just watched her handle that and handle it very graciously. And so I learned, I hope, I hope that I'm going to continue to walk in her steps. I'm trying very hard to emulate her. Thank you so much for sharing those two personal stories. It, it means a lot. I mean, I really like asking that question is because it kind of gives me an insight into who you are as a person. You know, we get so caught up in our profession and the topic, but at the end of the day, we all connect as humans together and right. it, those kinds of stories we can always connect with. It's been an incredible pleasure getting to speak with you. Can you please let our, let our listeners know where they can find you, whether it's a social channel, whether it's a website, and please let them know about your work. And I know you also have a, a book out as well, of course. Well, they can come to Fayetteville, Arkansas and meet me if they want to. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll welcome. That's, we'll that's have a quick party. and easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's the home of Walmart headquarters, so it's actually pretty darn easy to get here. Oh, wow. So, yeah, okay. we have a lot of direct that's flights amazing. to a lot of major cities. But anyway, um, I my website's drmargaretrutherford.com. I love to. I'm trying to develop a speaking kind of uh, reputation. I've done more speaking in the last year or two. Um, so I'd love to either do that virtually or, or in, or physically. And my, um, page does have a speaking, you know, contact kind of thing. Um, I, my podcast, as you said, is the self work podcast, S E L F W O R K. And we do that weekly. I have wonderful, wonderful guests and as well as do some of my own solo episodes. And then uh, my book is perfectly hidden depression It's available everywhere. It does have 60 exercises in it to help you begin to l very carefully let go of that control. I call it like a Jenga game. You know, when you have Jenga and you have to pull out a piece really carefully so the whole thing doesn't mm -hmm. crumble. That's what I hope this book feels like that I'm wow. asking you to take out one piece at a time very slowly and begin to understand what that feels like and then very slowly take out another piece um and obviously if you get into trouble i i constantly say work with a therapist if there's hitting a lot of mm. severe trauma but um those are the major ways and of course uh to go to my tedx on youtube i do have a youtube channel myself which we're trying to build but it's uh and there there's some interesting things over there if you want to go to youtube at dr margaret rutherford Awesome. Well, we'll definitely go ahead and link those down below just in case you can easily access those links. 
on our social channels. Dr. Rutherford, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure and I hope that we keep in touch. I know that we're in completely different worlds, but honestly, like this, this is, this is very meaningful work that you're doing. Uh, it's, it's, I, I think a lot of people can resonate with this and I'm deeply moved by the work that you're doing. So thank you so much for that. Anna, yet yeah, thank you. And by the way, my, the number one city of my podcast is New York City. So <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. And anytime you're in New York City, you know, you just, you just, all you have to do is let us know. All right. I will. I come up there pretty often, actually. <laughs>